Amen. You may have a seat. Thank you, worship team. And thanks, Chris, for uh, the good news about the mortgage. I was, uh, as I was preparing for this morning, I was looking over some old uh, slides and notes, and I think it was two years ago, we were, we were talking about the, the mortgage, and at that time, uh, we owed $550,000 two years ago. So uh, I, I don't think we would have dreamed to be at the point where we're at right now two years ago, which is just an amazing thing. So, morning everybody, my name's Will Arschel, I'm one of your pastors here. Chris was talking about scraping the bottom of the barrel when I preach, we are scraping the bottom of the barrel. Greg is in Ireland right now, it's not Ireland, uh, Ohio, he's actually in Ireland, Ireland with a, a family, uh, family event, so uh, let's hope he can get back, right? Um, so we're doing a, a series just reflecting on God's uh, faithfulness over the last 75 years here at Emmanuel and uh, the things that he's done here at this church and also the things that he's calling us to be doing today as well. Um, go ahead and give me that next slide. Yeah, and and uh, I think one of the key verses that, uh, that Steve put out for us was uh, Psalm 111.2 where it says, uh, How amazing are the deeds of the Lord. All who delight in him should ponder them. And um, the last 75 years here at the church have not been the deeds of, of people here at the church or the church as an organization. They've, they've been all God's deeds. And uh, in spite of us, he's used us to do some pretty amazing things here. So the praise goes to God for that. Uh, this morning, I want to talk to you a little bit about our, our mission as a church and uh, Greg had a pretty succinct way of putting that. He said, a, a church in Xenia to reach Xenia. And then another mission that we have is a church partnering with the body of Christ in reaching Xenia. And um, my wife and I came here, I, I came here to Emmanuel in 1979. Does that seem like ancient history to some of you folks? Savannah, when were you born? In 2000. This, it's like 79, is that even like part of history? No. no, what are you talking about, right? Well, so I, I showed up here as a 18-year-old, just graduated from high school, drove out in my VW Beetle from Los Angeles and joined my family here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. So I've been seeing all of the history of Emmanuel, but I've seen a chunk of it. So Don and Pat Dunstan were here. We were the college uh, career group, and I joined their group at that time. Yeah. Uh, but th these two statements in 79, if somebody had to ask us, well, what, what's... What's your purpose in an Emmanuel? I don't know that we necessarily would have picked these two statements. And so I just want to go back over a little bit of the history of the church and how, how do we get to the point of saying, hey, this is, these are key parts of our mission here. So uh, go ahead and give me that, that next slide. Um, so I just want, to, want you to go back in time. Some of you that have been here, this will be reliving some of it. And some of you that, that this is prehistory, you get some prehistory teaching too. Isn't that amazing? We're going to do some archaeology here of Emmanuel. Um, so in the, the 60s through the 90s, that was the last century. I just want to let you know, I'm not talking about this century. Um, uh, a big purpose of Emmanuel Baptist Church was Christian education. And uh, uh, when we saw things like Matthew 28, we focused in a lot on the teaching them to obey everything I commanded you or from Acts 2. It was the, the believers being devoted to the apostles' teachings. Now, there's, there's a lot more in both of those ver verses, but we spent a lot of time on that portion of it, which was the teaching portion of that. And it's scriptural. We need to be teaching uh, ourselves to obey, and we need to be uh, understanding God's word and his purposes in our lives. So those are, those are great things. Uh, but let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, how that affected the mission of our church. So go ahead and give me that next slide. So we... We spent a lot of time on teaching. We taught on, uh, we had four ti teaching times each week. Uh, we had our Sunday school classes, we had our service, we had our Sunday evening service, and then we had the Wednesday prayer meeting. And we did pray, but we did a lot of teaching first, and then right at the tail end, we tack on some prayer to our, to our teaching service as well. Um, we, there, there was a Xenia Bible Institute that was hosted by Emmanuel Baptist Church, and you could come and study in the evening, and, and uh, uh, it, it was sort of a, a mini MDiv program uh, because one of those didn't exist at, at Cedarville University at the time, and so we hosted that here. Uh, we 
one of the principal things that happened here during the week, which you don't get. Has anybody ever heard anybody talk about the, uh, the science room? Yeah, somebody's heard. Yeah, Pat knows that. So for those of us who used to be here in those times, there was a school here, Xenia Christian Day School. And uh, all the rooms were the history room or the science room or the locker room and those things because the school was here five days a week. And uh, everybody who was on the school staff was actually on the staff of the church. And one of the, one of the primary uh, missions of the church at that time was to provide Christian education for the Xenia community. Uh, now, it was kind of interesting because anybody from Xenia could come, but we also gave a 50% tuition reduction if you're a member of Emmanuel. So eventually most people who are sending their kids here joined Emmanuel Baptist Church because it was a lot cheaper to be a member of the church at that point. Um, and we had a very close association with, uh, with Cedarville University, which, which at that time was Cedarville College uh, because they didn't have any graduate studies. They were a college at that time. Uh, and uh, the, the church membership during that time re really reflected these things. And we said, what, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, almost everybody at the church had some association with Xenia Christian Day School or Cedarville College. And not that either one of those institutions is bad, but uh, uh, we, we didn't do much one another things within the church because everybody knew each other uh, and met with each other and socialized around the Xenia Christian Day School or Cedarville College. And those things, the, you know, the relational things really happened in those environments. So we did principally teaching here uh, at Emmanuel, and, your, and your, the relational aspect of your Christian walk happened through those institutions. And that was great if you happened to be a part of those institutions, but if you didn't, you weren't, then you were kind of missing out on that aspect of it because uh, you just weren't operating in those circles. Um, the other thing is that most of the families that were here at Emmanuel had a very deep uh, appreciation and commitment to Christian education. And uh, uh, so that was a high value statement for us during that time. Uh, and we didn't, we, we participated in evangelism. I didn't put this on the chart, but most of the evangelism was uh, overseas. Now, another interesting aspect of Emmanuel is, is that we had a lot of homegrown missionaries and a lot of folks that, uh, that, that uh, came from our church that we sent overseas. And so, so when we talked about evangelism, we talked about that in terms of our missionaries, okay? And so that we were sending people to the uttermost parts of the world to do evangelism. But we weren't really thinking much about evangelism from a local perspective because our mission here was more on the Christian education perspective. Now, you might think, well, if you're not evangelizing, then how do you grow as a church? Well, we had a constant stream of new families that were coming to the school and coming to Cedarville College. And so there was always new people coming, but they were organized around those institutions during that time. So this continued on. Go ahead and give me that next slide. Until uh, we, not on our own, but... Uh, situations happen where we had to reflect on, well, is this still our mission or what is the mission of our church? And uh, in the 90s, Savannah, does that still seem like prehistory? Yeah, it does. Okay. Some of you, that's still really prehistory. We're getting closer to current history. Um, Xenia Christian Day School transitioned to uh, be part of Dayton Christian Schools. And for a while, they operated here on this physical campus, but eventually they left. And uh, the, the high school and middle school were the first to leave. And then in 1990, what was it, Pat, 98? 99, uh, the, the elementary school left as well, too. And the, over to their current location across the street over here at, at the Legacy Campus. Uh, and the other thing that happened in 99, so, so on one hand, the, the thing that was the major uh, focus of our church, which was the school and Christian education, had physically departed and was under the leadership of a, a different organization. And our, our pastor, who had been our pastor for 30 plus years, uh, Pastor Wheeler, retired in 1999 as well too. So here we'd lost the, the man who was casting our vision and we lost our principal uh, mission uh, of our local church at that time. And so part of the question we had at that point was, well, what, wh who are we as a church? Why do we exist? And, and what, are we gonna, what, what do we need to be doing? So uh, we spent some time kind of reflecting on that as well. And uh, it's always a good thing to go back and check out and see what Christ's 
mission was for the church, because he's pretty clear about what he wants the church to be doing. There's, there's not many, many questions about that. So we went back to the great commandment, the great commission, right? So I'm going to put the great commission back up here. And um, we, we kind of look at that great commission, we, and we said, oh, well, there's, maybe there's some parts of it that, not that we had been ignoring them, but, but we haven't really been emphasizing as much. And there's that first part that says, go and make disciples, right? And um, most of the disciples that were being made in Emmanuel during those previous years were the kids of the families of the people who were coming in our church. So it wasn't that there weren't people coming to Christ, but it was the children of the families. And I think I could probably count on one hand that may not have even all the fingers of, of folks who would say from the ministry of Emmanuel Baptist Church that they came to Christ during the decade of the 80s and the 90s. Uh, so it's, and it wasn't that God wasn't redeeming people in Xenia, but he was doing it through other churches. Now I'm talking about, now, lots of, lots of the children of our families were being redeemed, right, and coming to Christ, but not many folks that were actually in our community outside of the folks that were at our church. And so it just really struck us that, well, we're, we're physically here in Xenia, and uh, we don't have the school anymore. And maybe God is calling us to actually get out into our community and to be part of our community and to look at what, what would it look like for us to be sharing the gospel with folks in our community. And, and if we did, what would it look like for us as a church is that they actually came to Christ and started coming here at that point. Um, and, and that gets in that, that whole other part of the teaching them to obey because we were we were fairly used to folks coming here and being fairly mature in their Christian walk as well, too. And uh, we didn't quite know how to start interacting with folks who were adult new believers because that never really had been part of who had been part of our church up to that point. So those were, those were big thoughts for us, things that we just had never really engaged with up to this point. But because of the the shifts of our, our leadership and uh, the shifts of the school, they said, hey, may we need to be engaging with that. So uh, as we looked at that, we said, wow, okay, uh, this is a big part of our mission, going into our community and uh, sharing the gospel there. And go ahead and give me that next slide. So, you know, par- part of where we, we, we came to the conclusion that uh, that, that it doesn't really matter what church you're at, right? And we'd been sending missionaries overseas to go do evangelism, but then it kind of struck us that, wow, we, we've, got, we've got a job to do evangelism right here, right here in our community. Uh, and that we're supposed to be making disciples, which means you need to be sharing the gospel with folks uh, right here. And, uh, and, and that's when we, we came up with our, our, our church's mission statement, which is down there at the bottom, where we say we desire to honor God and love people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And part of that, that loving people in a growing relationship also meant loving them enough to go out and go to where they're at and sharing the gospel with them. And, uh, and not just doing that in... Eastern Europe or South, you know, South America or Africa or Pakistan, but or China, but but doing it in Xenia, Ohio, yeah. So another thing that really struck us, go ahead and with this next slide, is that is that there, there's all there's all different flavors of churches that that are true doctrinally and and understand the gospel, and they all have different mission fields. And we happen to be in Xenia, and and the flavor of our community is a lot different than somebody's community in Centerville or Washington Township or Yellow Springs or Springfield. But this is where we are, right? God has called us to make disciples with the folks we're at. And so part of what we, we were even challenged with at that point is, do we even know who the people are, where we live? And do we have a good understanding of them? And, uh, and how would we go about doing that? So, uh, you know, p- part of it is we also even had to reflect on what say, well, what is a disciple? What does that mean? And so, you know, we went back to Matthew 4, 
uh, 19 and 20, it says, it says, Jesus called to them, he says, come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and they followed him. And so p- part of that is that call to follow Christ, right? So is, is engaging with people that their first desperate need is to know a savior and to understand why they even have that desperate need in their life because folks got all different kind of needs, right? And how, how would we start equipping ourselves to actually be sharing the good news of salvation with folks? Uh, and then how do, we, how do we help them actually start growing in Christ with where they're at? Uh, and then how do, we, how do we start encouraging them to start sharing with the people that they know that we don't know? Because everybody, everybody has a circle of folks around them that you know really well and you interact with that I don't, and nobody else in this church does, but you're given the opportunity to do that. Uh, we also took a hard look and said, well, what's our mission field? We had to, if we had to tell somebody, what, where, where's your principal mission field, right? And we kind of sat down and we said, okay, well, it's, it's Xenia. It's the city. It's this 28,000 people that we happen to be part of. And um, we said, yeah, and probably the townships that surround it, you know, so we kind of put a circle around our city. Um, and said, so that's our principal mission field. That's, that's who we need to be going and sharing the gospel with. And that's, that's who we ought to be targeting to make disciples, to, to teach them about Christ and encourage them to uh, conform to Christ and, uh, and go share the gospel themselves as well. Um, the other interesting thing is we said, well, you know, as we go do that, is it, is it us... Our job as pastors to go do that? Are we the, are we the people that are supposed to be doing that all the time? And uh, we, we also, one of, our, one of our value statements we came, we came back to is the, is the priesthood of believers, that we are all uh, have the opportunity to uh, reflect Christ in our lives, and we all have that opportunity to share the gospel. So go ahead and give me that next slide. So part of that is every one of us has an extended family uh, that we get to share with. And your, yours is different from mine, and you run into people every day that I never run into. But God has given you the opportunity, whether that's uh, your, your relatives uh, or your friends or your work environment, uh, your school, your activities, your neighbors, that's, that's, your, uh, that's your extended family that you spend time with every day. And, and every one of those oper- places, God is giving you, uh, has made you a steward of the gospel. And uh, you're, you're as much a steward as that as I am. Now, I have my extended family, folks that I run into every day in that environment, that, that uh, just, you know, I, I have the opportunity to share the gospel on, and, and so do you. But yours is different from mine. And if it's just uh, the, if we created a missions team and said these are the, the, the evangelism team in the church, uh, and they'll go uh, door-to-door and, you know, share evangelism on Wednesday nights or something like that, and then the rest of us will go do something else. We'd be missing out on all the people that all the rest of you get to interact with. So we said, no, we, we need to be uh, encouraging all of us to be, uh, to be sharing with folks and, and praying that they'll come to Christ and, and that uh, hopefully we'll be able to come and be part of us here at Emmanuel and, and uh, walk with Christ and be discipled here within our church. So the other thing that kind of struck us too is, uh, go ahead with that next slide, is that people come to Emmanuel, once we started doing this, um, they, they came with a lot of different reasons. And so, first we're just encouraged that they came, because up to that point, we, we really didn't have many people coming to Emmanuel besides the fact that they were coming to the, the day school. And once again, I'm not, I'm not dis- disparaging Christian education, but I'm just saying that was the principal reason why people came, or they came because they were part of Cedarville College at the time. Uh, what we found now is that there were, there were people that were actually coming that had nothing to do with Cedarville or the school. They were looking for a church. And they said, well, this might be a, a good church for us to come and be part of. Uh, and part of the challenge was many times they didn't know anybody here. Uh, we had people that, that uh, with the 2000s, and if you remember, there was a big crash of the economy in the late 90s and then in, the, in 2008 and stuff. We had people that were just desperately coming looking for help. And they didn't know anybody here either, but they heard that maybe a church was a good place to come get some help. And then, then uh, we had people that were coming with people 
because people actually started looking around saying, you know, investing in the lives of their next door neighbor or their friend at work or maybe some family that lived in the area as well. And they said, hey, you know what? I think you, you need to have a relationship with God through Christ and here's a good place to grow in that as well too. Um, and they, they came, they did know somebody, they were somebody's extended family, but that was kind of the only people they knew. Um, so part of the challenge we started having is, is well, how do, we, how do we start doing all the one another things we're called to do, right? When I say the one another, pray for one another, love one another, bear one another's burdens, right? Uh, confront one another in love, spur one another on in love and good deeds, and we could go on and on in those in, in the epistles. Um, how do we provide environments for us to really start engaging with each other so we can do these things? Because that's a critical part of discipleship is actually living life with each other. And yes, there's times for formal teaching from us and from other folks, but there's a lot of times for us to just walk life with each other. And uh, as, uh, as it says in Proverbs, for iron to sharpen iron, right? And, and uh, for us to do that. So uh, so that that was a big challenge for us to say, how do we set those kind of environments up? And that's when we started a lot of the small groups at that time, just to allow people to get to know each other and to get invested in each other's lives uh, as they're walking with the word. And you just heard about another one of those that's coming up, or a couple of them, right, this summer. The women's with their Ruth study. Uh, they're not doing this as a large group, you know, uh, instructor, teacher to a large group. They're going to be walking through Ruth in groups of four so that they can do those things together and build in each other's lives. The, the men's small group discipleship groups that we have going on, right? Uh, are guys getting together, uh, studying texts together, but also getting to know each other and praying for each other too. And uh, that's not just us as pastors doing that teaching, right? That's the, that's the we got guys that are helping us pick good texts to read through together, but it's guys helping each other learn learn what it means to apply these things, uh, you know, from God's word in, into our lives and sharing how that's going on with them as well, too. The, the reason I bring that up is those things weren't necessarily part of the fiber of, of a manual in the past, but they are now. And there was, a, there, was a, there was a long time of us thinking through and making a transition. It was hard to do because we weren't used to that. That was, that was a big deal for us to say that that needs to be part of, the, of what's going on here in the church. And the other thing that's, that's really interesting is when you, when you start opening your church doors up to your community, you're going to have folks with all different stages of spiritual growth. And so you may have some people that are just brand new believers, right? And, you know, in terms of their family heritage, maybe they're separated for a couple of generations from somebody that was a believer. Uh, and so, so they got passed down some traditions of of religion, but they didn't really understand the context of that. And uh, you may have people that are coming from whole different uh, denominations or doctrinal backgrounds and stuff. And they had, maybe they just, you know, their only introduction to Christ was at BBS 20 years ago. And, and uh, they're, they're trying to go from there. And on the other hand, you may have people that are, that are man, they've been walking with God for 40 years and they, they understand their gifts and they're ready to dive in and get plugged in and doing those kind of things too. So, so part of our, our challenge is, as our church leadership is say, how do, we, how do we help folks at all stages of where you are, whether you're a spiritual baby or you're a spiritual adult, to be able to grow and to use your gifts? And, uh, and, and that's challenging too because not everything is right for everybody, right? Not every study is going to meet all those needs. So part of it is to say, how do you start setting up environments to learn and to be discipled so that you can you can get folks who are farther along in their walk to come alongside of folks that are that aren't as far along as their walk so um all i'd say is we're still in the midst of this right now we haven't arrived uh we're still learning what this means and uh we're we're working hard on the balance of what it means for us to uh stay close to god's word we're not we don't want to walk away but we also, we, we want to make sure that we're taking time to get out to the, uh, anybody know how many people are in Xenia? Got a guess? 26,000? Well, you're with the U.S. Census. But 
Sarah and I are from the city of Xenia. We actually believe there's 28,000. So we got undercounted by about 2,000. But we're going to fix that, right? Is that fair, Sarah? Yep, we're going to fix that this year. Yeah, there are actually 28,000 people in Xenia. Uh, does anybody know how many churches there are in Xenia? There's a lot. <laughs> anybody want to take a guess? 60, yeah. About, it varies uh, someplace between 60 and 70. There's a number of smaller churches. But you know what? If the average size of most of the churches in town are about 110 people. So that means, a lot of people go, wow, you got 60 churches in your town? Well, yeah, we do. You know what that means? There's 20,000 people in our city that have no connection to a church. Now, it doesn't mean that all those 20,000 people aren't believers but, or don't have a relationship with God, but I would, I would bet there's a really good number of those don't. And uh, the fields are ripe for the harvest here in our city. And I, and I really believe that God has been preparing the hearts for a lot of those folks to come and be reconciled with him through Christ. And, and you know what? He doesn't need Emmanuel Baptist to do that. Isn't that an amazing thing? He's going to pull that off and make that happen whether we ever talk to anybody at all. But what he does say is he says, hey, I'm, I want you to be part of the joy and wonder of seeing people come to my body because it's going to strengthen your faith and it's going to help you use your gifts and you're going to be excited as you get to teach someone else about the things that you've learned from God, right? And see them grow in that and be frustrated just like we are with kids, right? Sometimes we, we look at our kids and say, man, that's amazing, right? And sometimes we look at our kids and say, How, oh, they're not part of my family. I don't, I don't understand this at all, right? So you'll get to go through all those frustrations, those kind of things too, just, just like you do with your kids. But God says, that's, that's we are here. We're here in Xenia. We get an opportunity to do that. Uh, and we get, to, we get to figure out how to do that together. So tonight, uh, one of the things that Steve's got on the agenda is for us to do a little bit of visioning about, well, what does it look like for us in the future at the church? And um, I just want to let you know, as, as, as pastors and elders, we, we don't have it all down. We don't have all the answers. There's no, this is, this is the absolute right, you know, uh, Bible teaching for the kids or the middle schoolers or for us as adults because our congregation shifts a lot. But if you, if you are seeing holes or saying, man, I think this would be a great thing for us to do, or here's some things I think we need to augment what we're doing, we're wide open, and we'll have an opportunity to talk about that some tonight. But I do know a couple of things, is that we are committed to this city. We're committed to being good stewards of the gospel of this city and sharing that with folks. And then we're also committed that when people come to Christ and they come with us, we want to be good stewards of helping you walk with Christ. And now that you're part of God's family, we want to see you walk well in his family as well. We're, we're, we're committed to that. And uh, there, there, uh, there's a hundred ways to do that. And we, we also believe in the priesthood of believers that you guys all have some great ideas and good gifts that God has given you that I don't have or Greg doesn't have or Steve or Van. And we need you to help us participate in that and also to do it as well, be part of that as well too. I'm going to switch gears uh, over to another topic that may have seemed a little bit strange to us when I showed up here in 1979. And uh, that's something, go ahead and give me that next slide. That's called uh, partnering with the body of Christ in this mission. Um, so to help you understand that, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you a little bit of historical background of Emmanuel Baptist Church and something called the General Association of Regular Baptists. So Go ahead, give me that next slide. So, um, how many knew that we are we were uh, in an association with the General Association of Regular Baptists? There you go, lots of hands. Are we in association with them right now? No. Who are we in association with? The Ohio Association of Regular Baptists, but not the National General Association of Regular Baptists. There you go. So how did that happen, and why are we 
associated with these guys and from an association perspective. So um, I just want to give you a little bit of history of the General Association of Regular Baptists. Well, back in, uh, back in the 1920s, there was a denomination called the uh, North, Northern Baptist Convention. And uh, in, in the decades of the teens and the 20s, uh, that church, to all intents and purposes, or that denomination became what we would call apostate. And we say, well, that's an interesting term, apostate. So, so what, what's going on? Well, they started preaching another gospel. So Christ no longer was part of the Trinity and the Son of God. Uh, he was a great teacher, though. He was a good guy and had some good things to say. Uh, the scriptures weren't the Word of God. They were, they were a good book, you know. And there's probably some other good books out there as well, too. And there was wisdom in those things that were kind of passed out or figured out by people. And, and, uh, and, but other people had wisdom as well, too. So... Um, there were a lot of folks that were part of that convention that said, wait a second, who is this God you think you're talking about now? And what's this revelation that you think this God has for us? And uh, they established a new association called the General Association of Regular Baptists. And the term regular there says we, we, we believe in the regular understanding of God, of the Trinity, of the holiness of God and and the redemption of man through the sacrifice of his son. And we believe in the regular understanding of scriptures, that they're God-inspired and they were given to us as a revelation of God and his plans for our lives. And they weren't just created by men. Um, and so that stood up in, uh, in the 1930s. Uh, and one of the key foundational points of the regular Baptist was to say we can't, we can't associate with those of you uh, that aren't teaching these things anymore. Uh, and that was a hard thing for uh, folks in that denomination because the denomination owned the church buildings, the denomination owned the retirement accounts of the pastors. And if you as a church decided that, hey, we, we're very concerned about what the direction that your church is headed, uh, you would lose your church building and your staff would lose their retirement benefits. And there was a big financial hit to folks. But uh, there were a number of folks who said, it doesn't matter, uh, we, we, we're gonna stand with God even though it costs us a lot. And it did, it cost those church a lot of things to say, no, we're not, we're not gonna head, head with you uh, in the Northern Baptist Convention. Um, and, and one of their key verses of that was uh, Romans 16, 17. It says, it says, I urge you brothers and sisters to watch out for those who caused divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. It says, keep away from them. And so they said, we, we want to stay with the things that we've learned about God and the God that we know and uh, our relationship with him. And uh, we're going to keep away from folks that are teaching things that, that are foreign to this. And we're just not going to associate with them. Uh, so in, in practical terms, over time, uh, this meant not only separation from what you would call an apostate church, those that, that don't recognize the God we know or the scriptures that we know, but, but it also uh, practically worked its way out that folks in the GIRBC didn't associate with anybody who didn't uh, agree with them 100% within the denominational uh, doctrine statement as well, too. Uh, and uh, which is interesting because many of the writings of the folks who were with the GRBC said, hey, you can fellowship with a, you have another fellow pastor and you know he's a believer and he's a great guy. You can get together with him and pray with him and study with him, do those things. But, you, you know, unless he's with you 100% of your doctrinal statement, you, your, two, your two churches can't. <laughs> do that, but you can do that. So there was individual uh, d decision making, but from a from a corporate perspective or institutional, that there was a there was a real separation there. Um, and there was also another practical outworking of this that really came from from just the stress of the church in the twenties, where you had some congregation said, "It's going to cost us everything, but we're going to stand with God, and we're going to leave the denomination." Uh, and you had some other ones that said, well, it's going to cost us a lot, so we're going to try and stay in the denomination 
and uh, teach truth here, but we're not going to necessarily leave the denomination. And so the, the, there was a sense of folks that had left and had paid a huge price that said, well, you guys need to do the same thing. You just need to separate yourself from apostasy. And so they, they basically said, if, if you're not going to leave, if you're still in association with those, even though you may be teaching truth, but you haven't left those who are not teaching truth, we're just not going to have fellowship with you either. We're going to cut our ties with you as, as well. So this is, you, you, you may have run around if you've been in the GRBC circles, this is that context of something called the second separation uh, there, which basically says if, uh, if Savannah's okay and I'm okay and you're okay, but you're hanging out with somebody who's not okay, then I'm not going to hang out with you at that point. Um, so the, so go ahead and give me the next slide. So um, to all intents and purposes, the history of our church as we were part of that denomination was that we, we, we operated within that practical separation terms. Uh, and we really did not fellowship with anyone unless they were a member of the GARBC. And to all intents and purposes, we really didn't fellowship with anybody in the GRBC either. We just operated as an independent Baptist church. And once again, it was an association. There was no hierarchical structure within that. Uh, we were in association from the context of mutual support, but we really didn't seek much mutual support. Um, and, and the reality was not much was given. Uh, we had a very hard time in the 90s, and I... Uh, with a church split, and, and we had one other JRBC church here in town, and things were not going well with us in that other church. And we had a very large number of other JRBC churches in Springfield and Dayton. And I remember uh, Kim and I went to a, a pastor's retreat, and I sat down with those other pastors, and I said, guys, we are just, we're hurting here in Xenia, and we desperately need you guys to come alongside and help us. And uh, kind of the response I got was, well, that's just not what we do. We don't, we don't get involved with the, the operations of the other churches and stuff. And, and um, so there wasn't, there wasn't much engagement from this association at that time either. But this, this kind of continued on till 2006, and, and then something very interesting happened. In, in 2006, uh, Cedarville University at that time, which was, um, had, had been fairly tightly associated with with the General Association of Regular Baptists was uh, 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 declared separate from the JRBC by the JRBC convention. And that was principally because uh, the board of uh, directors at Cedarville had put an open invitation to the Southern Baptist Convention to send their students there. And uh, the, the thought process of the the, uh, the Council of 18 was that uh, even though Cedarville might be doctrinally sound, they were starting to associate with a denomination that they viewed not doctrinally sound at that time, which was the Southern Baptist Convention. And so they said, as, a, as an association, we're not going to associate with Cedarville. And then they, they asked us as participating churches in the association to follow suit as well, too. And that was, it was a fairly traumatic thing here for Emmanuel Baptist um, how many of you have something to do with Cedarville? Just raise your hands right now. Yeah, because you know what? If we'd follow through with that, you wouldn't be sitting here today because <laughs> we wouldn't be associating with you. We'd be associating with somebody else, but not you guys. Uh, we had a lot of uh, faculty at Cedarville and students and other folks, and it, it helped. It caused us really to kind of step back and said, wow, there's, there's some real practical implications of this. Do we really... Do we, are, is this really where we believe that God is calling us as a church to be? And do we really believe that we, this level of separation from the, body, from the rest of the body of Christ is healthy at that point? So um, the conclusion we came to was, uh, no, it's not. And in 2007, we departed from the General Association of Regular Baptists. And uh, also at that time, the Ohio Association of Regular Baptists uh, said, hey, we, we, we don't believe uh, that this level of separation in a practical sense is healthy for the body of Christ either. So we, we maintained our membership in the Ohio Association of Regular Baptists, as did most regular Baptist churches in Greene County and Clark County and Montgomery County. So we all 
uh, made a transition away from the, the General Association of Regular Baptists and, and kind of converged on the, uh, the Ohio Association of Regular Baptists. Uh, but as we went through that, we then said, well, okay, if we're going to participate with Cedarville, is there somebody else we ought to be participating with? Because I'll just tell you, up to that point, we, we literally had not participated with any other believers in our city or county or state outside of the General Association of Regular Baptists. And I, I remember um, going around to other churches at that time, and you know, the interesting thing was uh, most folks didn't even know we were a church. And I said, hey, I'm Will Urschel, I'm from Emmanuel Baptist Church. And they said, oh, where is that? And I said, oh, it's south of Toy Street. And they go, oh, you mean the school? And they said, yeah, we know there's a school there. We didn't know there was a church there. And uh, literally, you, you couldn't hardly find anybody in Xenia that even knew that we existed uh, as a church. Uh, they, they knew it, was, it, it used to be a school because there used to be a sign on the side of the building that said Xenia Christian Day School. And they said, well, we thought that school had moved because the sign went down. We didn't know what, had, what else had gone on there. So um, at that time, we, in addition with, with our our doctrinal statement, we came up with some, some values for us as a church that we wanted to move forward on. And one of those value statements had to do with partnering. And let me put that up here. Uh, we said we, we desire to partner with other believers in reaching the lost and encouraging the saved, raising up shepherds, caring for the needy, and protecting the message of the gospel. And uh, we just had a sense that uh, God had a bigger purpose for the body of Christ besides just Emmanuel Baptist in the city of 28,000 people and that there might be some other folks that we needed to be partnering with as we're doing our mission, right, which is loving people and honoring God. Um, now, what we started running into was we found there's a whole spectrum of people that want to part partner there were people that had really sound understanding of who God was that had no desire to partner with anybody, and that's okay. There were people that were basically apostate that definitely wanted to partner with everybody. And we said, well, that's not good, right? Uh, so we had to put a little bit of a filter in terms of what does that look like? What, what, what does that mean for us to partner, and who, who would it be good for us to partner with, and, uh, and what kind of things would we be partnering in? And so... Um, this is also coming out of our, our doctrine review that we are doing as elders right now. But uh, we, we basically said there's some non-negotiables. And there's some things that if, you, if, you, if we don't have the same God and we don't have the same understanding of, his, of, of the calling in our lives and uh, the calling in our church, then we, we can't partner with you to do something because we're just going to be at, at odds with each other at that point. So let me, let me put some things up. So there, there, are, there are things that that when you come to be a member of Emmanuel, we say you, just because just you want to be here and attend with us, if you don't understand these things, you, you can't partner with us in membership. You can't partner with us in being part of the, of the life of the body of the church. And that's part of the reason why Greg goes, has his membership class. It's not just to let you know what the dues are and those kind of things. We actually go over, make sure that everybody has an understanding of who God is and our relationship with him through Christ. Uh, and so just, just as we, we, you can't partner with us here at the church unless you uh, are trusting in those things, understand those things, we can't really partner with, with you as an, as an organization in our city as well either. So, you know, things like that are our are, are understanding of, of the, the, that we have a triune God, uh, that, that, uh, that, that Christ as the Son had a physical incarnation here on earth, and that he had a physical death, uh, and that that death was a substitute for the payment of our sins before the holy God, and that there is no other payment. There's nothing that we can create on our own, and it's not a Jesus plus. It's not Jesus plus our good works, uh, that our, our, our good works are filthy rags, and that, that it's Christ's blood and his works that allow us to be redeemed. Uh, we talked about the fact that that Christ had a physical resurrection as well, and that demonstrates his power over sin and death. And that we, if that's not true, then, uh, then what are we hoping in at this point? If, if God doesn't have the power to do that, 
uh, we, we talk about what the purposes of the church are. And uh, let me tell you, as you start engaging some other churches, there's a whole spectrum of understanding of what the church is all about as well. Um, and that, and that this, the context that the church is here as God's vehicle to reach and save the lost and to teach them to obey and, and to be part of his body. And if you've got some other purpose for the church, then we probably aren't going to be able to partner with you. Uh, and that Christ is returning and that there is going to be a day of judgment and, uh, and that we'll all stand before God's throne, right? And be held accountable for our, our actions. Uh, and thank goodness that, there's, that, that God has called some of us to be part of his body through his uh, redemption. But there are those that, that aren't. They're gonna, that, that, that there, there is something for us all to fear, uh, which we were all condemned. We were all under God's wrath. And but for Christ, that we would be under God's wrath for all of eternity. Uh, and then also the authority of the scripture, that we're not seeking additional texts and books and understandings and revelations of individuals to understand God's word, that, that he's given each of us his spirit and he's given us his word. And that's complete and that's sufficient for us to uh, carry out our mission and, and have the relationship with him that we need. So those are just some, some basic things that as we look to, to, to folks to say, yeah, we want to partner with you. And uh, in this mission of going into Xenia and being part of that, 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 that you'd be a good partner for us to have with that. Now, um, there are preferences that we have and our understandings of doctrinal things that we probably, some of these partners, may not bring them in, be, come in here to teach uh, necessarily because we say this is our our, our understanding of things that augment that, but these are the core things. So uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations, uh, parachurch groups and churches in town that we feel very comfortable partnering with the gospel in town, but not necessarily to say, yeah, we want you guys to come in and be our principal uh, teachers of the word at that point. And they probably wouldn't ask us to come do that at their church necessarily either. There are those, we'd be very comfortable to have them do that. And you say, well, well what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, there, there, there are preferences in terms of church polity, of, uh, of, of uh, you know, is, is, is foot washing a command for all of us? Some churches believe it is. Uh, we don't necessarily believe that. Now, is, is foot washing a bad thing? No, it's not. We don't necessarily believe that's a commandment that, uh, that we're required to do when we take communion. There are other churches that do. Uh, we don't believe that that would keep us apart from them in terms of sharing the gospel, but that wouldn't necessarily be a teaching we have here, and they wouldn't have their, their, their understanding of uh, the communion service uh, without the foot washing at their place. Um, so this, this is a constant challenge for us as well, too, because personalities change with uh, shepherds at churches and leaders of parachurch organizations. And uh, uh, just because you're part of a denomination doesn't mean that you... You own truth, and everything you ever teach is always true. Uh, we need to uh, evaluate uh, the leaders of these groups and the things that they're teaching on a case-by-case -case basis as we walk along with them. And there's times that some organizations we can partner with very well, and there's times we say, hey, based upon where you're headed right now, we're going to step back because uh, uh, we, the, the God that you're talking about and, and the body of Christ you're talking about is not, not our understanding who that is. But I wanted to put up here just to give you a sense a little bit about some of the folks that we are partnering with right now. So uh, Jeremiah Tree is an organization here in town that works with folks that uh, need recovery from addiction. And it's a residential program, and you know part of that program is, is not just learning responsibility of life, but also learning what it means to be part of God's family. And, and we're all about that. As a matter of fact, we have folks here in our congregation that are on their board. Um, Bridges of Hope is our our uh, drop-in shelter here, adult drop-in shelter. And they are committed not just to providing a home for somebody here in town and a meal, but also to see them get introduced to Christ. And, and that really you're, maybe the, the most desperate need you have isn't just a place to sleep tonight, but it's to be reconciled with the creator of the universe. Uh, the Xenieri Association of Churches and Ministries. Uh, this is a group that uh, had a fairly... Uh, I'd, I'd almost say apostate understanding of who God was, but there were a number of churches back in uh, 2008 that got together and say, hey, we really need to have an association of those of us that have a common understanding of, of the gospel and of God, 
and a way for us to uh, to associate. And so, the, basically, at that time, there there were seven or eight churches that said, "Hey, we're gonna." That that association was dying out. They said we want to resurrect it and and work well together. We weren't all part of the same denomination, weren't necessarily all Baptists, but we had those those non negotiables. We had concurrence on, and so we're we're very active in that association right now. Uh, Legacy Christian School, uh, very active with those folks as well too, and what's going on with the schooling there and and encouraging that. Uh, Athletes in Action, which is across the street. Uh, we, you know, in terms of their mission and sharing the gospel, and being, uh, you know, winning influencers within the sports arena, and and also they have a pretty amazing uh, vision now to to uh, reach out to uh, high school students uh, here in Xenia as well too, and local college students. Um, Cedarville University, we've maintained our relationship with them, and uh, you know, encourage families to send their kids there, and uh, we we love having the staff. Uh, from the college there as well too. Uh, Classical Conversations is a homeschooling group that uh, uh, comes and meets in our building every Tuesday. And uh, uh, a, a group that wants to see kids raised in the knowledge of uh, a Christian worldview. And so we partner with them as well. So those are, those are ministries in the area that we have a very close partnership with. Uh, and I should say examples because there's, there's a whole plethora of other ones that we've partnered with in different ways as well. Um, in terms of churches, uh, I just listed six churches that uh, we've been working fairly closely with here. Uh, Xenia Grace Chapel, which is uh, south on 42. Um, Xenia Nazarene over on 2nd Street. Uh, Home Church on Home Avenue. Uh, Liberty Worship Center out on 2nd uh, Street just outside of town. Uh, AHOP over here uh, just a block away. Uh, the first ch- Andy's Church, First Church of Christ. Uh, the, these are the, the shepherds of these churches. Uh, we've gotten to know these men and uh, have just a deep uh, uh, respect for them, for their, for their desire to see folks uh, come to Christ and be discipled in our, in our city. Uh, in terms of our preferences, there's a lot, of, a lot of these churches that have things that wouldn't be our preference to teach, and we wouldn't ask them to come teach on those things. But uh, in terms of those non-negotiables, we feel very comfortable with, with these guys and what they're doing with their churches. Now, some of them are anomalies within their denomination, and it just doesn't mean, be, hey, we partner with this church ir- irrespective of whoever you, you choose as a pastor. And if, uh, if these pastors switch over, we would take a hard look at that as well, too, because uh, that new pastor may have a whole new understanding of the gospel. Uh, so this is, that's why I say these things aren't permanent. They're uh, they're a fluid thing, and it's the same thing for the ministries up above, too. There may be times those ministries don't have the same understanding of the gospel as we do, too. And those, are, those would be things we'd, we'd need to take a hard look at. Um, so, where are we at now? Well, I th- th- this is an exciting time for our church, because God is calling folks to Christ in our city every day. And... Uh, we've got all different kind of backgrounds of folks. We've got some folks that are highly educated. We have some folks that never even got their high school diploma. We've got some folks that are financially really well off and some that are kind of struggling with where am I going to be sleeping tomorrow night. We've got some folks that had the blessings of growing up in a family that knew God and loved God and going to uh, schools that did that and being around lots of folks every day of the week that had wisdom and uh, got to share wisdom with them and do the one other things. We have other folks that they'd have to say, you know what, Uh, I got nobody (laughs) in my circle of people I contact all week besides you guys at this church that know God or have any wisdom. You're it. And so uh, this is... is, uh, this is a spectrum of folks, and that's the amazing thing, is God allows us to intersect with so many different folks, but it's a challenge for us as a church too, right? Because he's calling us out of our comfort zone. It's, it's really easy to hang out with people like you, that have your interests and uh, your background and your level of spiritual maturity, because you talk about the same things and understand the same things, and pretty much agree on the same things. It's a whole different spectrum when 
you're dealing with folks that don't have anything to do with your background and uh, may, may not have much of an understanding of who God is and uh, and, and you've got you to step up and, and say, hey, this relationship is about me giving, right? It's not about me being comfortable. And so I just tell you, one of the things, uh, there's a couple things I do on Sundays. Because uh, sometimes it's really easy to come to church and just be a critic, right? You can be a critic of the music. You can be a critic of the lighting. You can be a critic of the, the sound from the worship team. Were they too loud? Were they too soft? Were they my style of music? Were they not? You can be a critic of us that are teaching, okay? That's, 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 you know, we can do all that. I don't think there's a spiritual gift called being a critic, okay? And I don't know that that's a spiritual calling in the church. But I, I do believe that when we come on Sunday mornings, God is calling us to have our eyes open for the one and other things, right? Who is it, God, that you want me to come and to pray for today? God, who is it that I need to encourage today? God, who is it that maybe showed up at the church, doesn't know what the gospel is, and I could go, and I have an opportunity to share that with them today, right? Maybe, God, who is it that needs to be confronted in love that has something that they're doing that's just destroying them or their family, and they need to hear from me about, I'm, I'm concerned for you because <laughs> the path you're on is going to be destruction. And that's not where God is calling you. You don't have to do that anymore, right? And I could go on and on and on with those things. So I would just, I would encourage you when you come on Sunday morning, come, come with the expectation that we're going to be worshiping God. We want to be doing that. We want to be in awe of God. Come with the expectation that, that the Holy Spirit is going to be working on you with his word and telling you some things that you need to be putting off and telling you some things you need to be putting on. But come, come with the expectation of having your eyes open saying, wow, who is it that before I leave here today, that God wants me to come alongside and use my gifts with, right? Um, and you know what? You can't be, the only person you can be a critic with there is yourself. Because you either choose to do it or you don't, right? That wasn't my responsibility whether you did that or the sound guys or the worship team or, you know, whoever else. That was you that chose to do that. So I, I would be a little bit of a self-critic with that. Um, my, my Sundays start when I leave my house at 6.30. And uh, I have a couple things I need to get done. I come here at the church at 6.30 and get things set up for my class and do that. And then I, I go out from uh, 7 to 8.30 and I pick five churches to go pray with them. That God can be fruitful in what they have going on in their church. And God convicted me. I said, you know, I'm, I'm coming to our church every Sunday morning, and I'm driving by. You literally can't come to Emmanuel without driving by some other churches. I don't know, maybe you can map it out, figure it out how to do it in town. But you can't. And it's really easy to drive by them and forget that, you know what? God's working right there just like he's working here. Isn't that a scary thought? Wow. And, and maybe, maybe there's some things going on in that church that, if I knew about them, I'd be really encouraged about that. So uh, I go pray with Gary. He's the children's director at Liberty Worship. And he makes me coffee. And that's a really good relationship. So <laughs> I get Liberty coffee. But you know what? Gary prays for you guys every Sunday morning. You didn't even know that, did you? Hmm. I go see Mark Atherton, who's a senior pastor at Zenia Naz. And we pray for Mark as he's teaching. And we don't pray for me because I don't get to teach much. But we, we pray for Greg or we pray for Van or Steve. But you know what? Mark prays for you guys because he wants to see us grow in the gospel, right? And grow in Christ and be effective here. I go and I meet with the worship team at Home Avenue, at Home Church. And 
we pray for, I pray for them. But you know what? The worship team at home church prays for you guys on Sunday mornings. I meet with the greeters at AHOP. <laughs> There's a crew of six of them that do the greeting there. And you know what they do? <laughs> it's a great thing. Everybody's coming to the door. They grab them. They say, stop. We're going to pray for Emmanuel Baptist Church. Sometimes we have 20 people in the front of AHOP praying for our church. So there's, there's one another's amongst us as individuals, but there's also one another's with a, us as the body of Christ. So we need to be praying for each other as churches in town. We need to be spurring one another on to love and good deeds with other parts of the body of Christ because the body of Christ in our city, thank goodness, is a lot bigger than us. I, I don't know if we could bear the responsibility of saying we're the only people that are preaching the gospel in a city of 28,000 and we bear the responsibility of discipling all those folks. I, personally, that would be overwhelming to me, okay? But I, I, I know that there's a lot of other good men and women out there, good, good shepherds of the other churches and, and believers, they're saying, yeah, we're, we're part of that job here in our city. And we, we want you guys to be successful, and we want to be successful too. And we want to reap the harvest of what's going on in Xenia and those townships around us as well. Yeah. One other thing I'd, I'd just challenge you on is that um, we don't know how long we have to be a steward of the gospel with somebody. And it's very easy to be complacent and say, well, there's always next week, right? There's next month to do that. Last week I was out at, uh, at Bridges and uh, there was a young couple, Chad and uh, Abby, who had been there last summer and I got to know them pretty well and they had gone off and done some other things and they just happened to come back. And Abby was talking to me about how, you know, things were just really falling apart. And they finally had come to the conclusion that they couldn't make it work. And they desperately needed some help. And I said, Abby, I'm so glad to hear that. She goes, glad to hear that. I'm telling you, my life's falling apart. I said, well, I'm glad to hear the fact that you figured out you can't do it on your own. And I said, let's get together. And uh, she said, I'd like to do that. So we set up a time. And... Uh, Next day, I was over at Bridges, and we had two state troopers show up, and they were looking pretty serious. And they walked in the door, and they said, well, uh, Abby died today in a car wreck. Now, God doesn't need me to share the gospel with Abby, and he has plenty of opportunities to do that. But as we went through the mechanics of uh, trying to find some next of kin and what do we do with her body and deal with those things? It hit me that a lot of times I take it for granted that I can share the gospel with somebody anytime I want to because they'll always be there. And they won't. Okay? Now, I, I, I trust that, that God... Uh, can provide lots of folks and, and he will call those to him and it doesn't rely on Will Urschel whether he's going to call somebody to him or not. But I also trust that he gives me opportunities that many times I walk away from and I don't take advantage of. So uh, I would just encourage us as we, as we look forward that um, we need to take a hard look at how complacent we are as well. And what, what are the things that... Uh, God's saying, hey, I want you to set aside. Remember when Paul talked about the Roman soldier who set aside everything that encumbers them, right? What are the things that are encumbering us from being ministers of the gospel in our city and in our congregation here? And, and what, what is it that we need to set aside so that we can really be part of this high calling that God has in our city for us? And those things... The things that God's calling me to set aside are not the same things he's calling you to set aside and maybe completely different ones. But I think we all need to be praying hard about that. 
And maybe there's things we need to be setting aside as a congregation that we've been too focused on that we need to be doing. it. And tonight's a good time for us to get back together as a body and talk about some of those things as well too. So I'm going to ask the worship team if you guys come up and let me just pray for us. Father, thank you for um, loving us and um, being willing to call us to you when we had no desire for that. And even though we were rightfully under your wrath, God, and we deserved condemnation and separation from you for all of eternity, you've called us into your family. And as Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And God, none of us here had anything to do with that. That was all your works. And it cost you so much, God, to to pay the penalty of our sins. And yet you did it because you loved us so much. God, help us to never stop being in awe of that. Both as just individuals and as a church here, God. And God, help us be humble to the calling you have for us here in our city. And, uh, be willing to set aside stuff that's that's keeping us from that calling God. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.